Good morning. It's interesting. I have one of those. I'm having uh, having one of those days where I struggled with with where I was going to preach exactly. A couple ideas, a couple thoughts, a couple different passages, and uh, I can't this last. I can't say last minute, but and this had been one of the thoughts. But the Lord uh, kind of solidified this as as where He wanted me to speak. Um, Hebrews chapter eleven and verse twenty four, and uh, just every about every Sunday morning, uh, Dan comes in. He says, "So what's the what? What are you preaching on?" And those days, then I I kind of saying, "Well, uh, my uh, uh, um, I think this is where we're going to go." Um, he starts laughing. Um, it happens. It doesn't happen all the time, but it happens on occasion. And uh, this morning, I, I kind of do that, and I said, "This is where I think we're going to be. I think this is where the Lord's leading us." And he says, "Wow!" And it, honestly, the the, the the song service went exactly together with with uh, the message. It goes together with the message this morning. The the songs that he had picked without me talking to him. Uh, he'd been praying about those songs and praying about what the Lord would do. Praying about the uh, asking. Normally he asks a, 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 about a slide and uh, you know what what I would want. He didn't, but God kind of led him in a direction. And it's amazing how God works together in, other, in different people's hearts. Let's praise the Lord for that. For one, it confirms that this is where God wants me to be. <laughs> but two, it just shows the unity of the, the Spirit of God in it this morning. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 24, we're going to read those first four verses again. We're going to pray, and we're going to share what the Lord's laid upon my heart. And verse 24 says, By faith Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Esteeming the reproach of Christ, greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you, Lord, for the example that we have here of Moses. God, I pray that you will lead and guide as we dissect your word, I pray that uh, you help us to interpret it correctly. Help me to preach it, proclaim the truth through here. And Father, may your spirit work in the hearts of all of us, Lord, to make us more and more like Christ. And Lord, if there's one here today that's not saved, Lord, one who's never by faith done anything, they've never trusted in Christ, I pray that today, that Lord, that this might be the day that they would accept what Christ did for them on the cross and trust Him for salvation. We thank you, Father, for all you do for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you've ever been to Sunday school or grew up in church, uh, uh, you hear the word Moses, and I'm reminded of the very first story of Moses and the bulrushes. Uh, uh, if we would go back into, into the book of, uh, of Genesis if, or Exodus, if we would go back to the book of Acts and, and read through the story, and for sake of time, we're not going to read this, read the whole account of his life, but uh, Moses was born uh, an Israelite uh, to a mother and father who were devout Jews who who were defying the king's order. Now, you need to know what the, the king's order was. And In fact, the, the very verse before what we read says that by faith, Moses, when he was born, was hid three months of his parents because they saw he was a proper child and they were not afraid of the king's commandment. The king sp- spoken of here was Pharaoh. Pharaoh's commandment um, was that all the children of Israel, all the male children were to be killed. Uh, uh, the children of Israel were, were in bondage to the people of Egypt. Uh, when Joseph came to Egypt, he had a place of authority, or was given a place of authority over a period of time. God, God put him there to save the people of Israel, or else they would have starved uh, during the time. But, and God used them while they were there. But God promised Abraham, long before Joseph was ever born, that that was going to happen, that they would go into, into Egypt. 
Egypt and they would be in bondage as slaves for 400 years. As, as Joseph and his, and, his, and his family and his brothers, and uh, they had children, they began to multiply, the, the, the numbers began to grow so much so that the, uh, that the next king, who did not fear God, uh, did not trust Joseph, uh, uh, he began to be afraid that they were going to be overrun by, uh, by, by Jews. And the truth is, they didn't like the Jews at all. They didn't like Israel at all. Uh, they hated them. Uh, the, the Egyptians uh, hated uh, sheep farmers. They hated people that dwelt with sheep, and they looked down upon them. So they decided to put them in bondage, thinking that by putting, by putting them, making them slaves, that they'd be able to control the number of people. Well, God blesses his people, doesn't he? Regardless of what the world's doing around us, and God blessed the children of Israel, and they began to have more and more children. And, and, uh, uh, and so the king said, okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to have, we're going to have the midwives who are there at the, uh, who are there at the birth, we're going to have the midwives kill them uh, for threat of their own life, kill the babies that are born. And the midwives, uh, by faith, didn't do that. Uh, they, uh, they refused to kill the children, and they told the soldiers that the children were born too quickly before they ever got there. And Oh, well, we can't help it. So then Pharaoh said, okay, any, any young man, any boy that's born uh, is, is to be killed. And so, so here you have Moses born uh, to his mother and father. They're slaves in Egypt. The king has declared that Moses should die, but, but that his parents, in faith to what God said, in faith that God would keep their son alive, took him and they hid him uh, in his mother took him and hid him for three months and when it got to the point where they could no longer hide him anymore she put him in bulrushes uh, she made a little basket she wove this basket she covered it in pitch and she had her daughter take it down to the river and put it in the river the Nile River and 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 praying that God would take care of that child and who found it if you go, if you grew up in Sunday school, you know it was the it was the Pharaoh's daughter found the child, and so so uh, uh, the little girl was watching from the, the the reeds sees Pharaoh's daughter pick up the child, and and realizing who it was, she decided not to turn this baby into the king so he could be drowned or or fed to the crocodiles or whatever else they were going to do with that child. She decided this child will be mine, but she needed a nurse. And who will nurse for this child? Well, the book of Acts tells us that, that, uh, the, that his sister stepped forward and said, hey, I know somebody that could be a nurse for this child. And she said, Let, here, take him. And for many years, until the child was weaned, he rested in the arms of his mother. Isn't God good? To take care of and provide for and watch over this, this, this little boy who would one day lead the people of Egypt out of Israel. To set them free uh, from the bondage that they were in for 400 years. God can take just a little child and make so much more out of it. Understand, God can do the same for each one of us. There is unlimited potential in each one of us that are here today. God could bless and use you. But God used Moses because Moses by faith followed him. So he's raised as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He is educated. He learns the language of the Babylonians. He dresses well. He lives in the palace or, or near the palace. Uh, uh, he, uh, the book of Acts tells us that he is well-spoken, has much power, and, and uh, wise in his words. And, and he has, a, there, there is just a, 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 a not, I don't want to say the word aura. There is a, a presence about Moses. Uh, he has a power about him. Uh, listen, uh, uh, the, 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 he, he, he had it all. Think about it. He grew up in the palace. There wasn't anything that, 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 that he could not have. There wasn't a position that he could not have. Uh, uh, the Pharaoh's daughter raised him. That meant Pharaoh was his adopted granddaddy. I don't think that he pushed him off. I don't think he was made to, to be an outcast. But there came a point in Moses' life where he said, this is not what I want. I think part of this has to do with the years that he spent uh, uh, being held by his mother. Now, when we, we, we think of women who are nursing their children, um, uh, some women don't nurse their children anymore, and I'm not, I'm not here to argue the nursing versus, versus uh, formula feeding. That's not what this is about. Uh, what I want you to understand, uh, there is nothing wrong with nursing, by the way, but I want you to understand when they nursed back in those days, uh, when they weaned a child, though a child wasn't weaned at four months, it wasn't weaned at six months, 
months. It wasn't we needed a year or even two. Sometimes those children go four and five years. That was normal before it was fully weaned, where no longer needed the, uh, that, that time with the mother. And at that point in time, he went to live. So for years, he could have been four or five years old before, uh, before he was really under the influence of the Pharaoh's daughter. As long as that nurse was taking care of him, she, his mother, she had time to teach him and to talk to him. And don't tell me she didn't tell him about his people. He learned about his people from somebody. He learned about not just his people, but their God from somebody. He learned about the God of Israel. He learned of the promises of, to, to Abraham, the Abrahamic covenant, that they would be his people. Uh, the, 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 through their seed, God was going to bless all nations. He heard all of those promises at the, at the feet of his mother. And as he, as he grew older, and once he got into Pharaoh's house, he was taught many other things and, and, and many other things. It had much power. It had, there wasn't anything that he couldn't have. But there came a point in his life where he made a choice. And this morning, this is what I want to talk about. Because the truth is, we need people who are willing to make a choice. They're going to choose Christ over the world. We're going to choose Christ over the world. Let's go back and look at the, the passage that we're at in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 24. By faith, Moses, when he was come to years, when he became an adult, it says he, refu he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He did not, he no longer wanted to be, to be identified as somebody who was the daughter or, or the, the, the grandchild of Pharaoh or the, the daughter of, 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 the son of the daughter of Pharaoh. He wanted to change his identity. Why? Because he knew who he really was. He knew that he was born an Israelite. Listen, think about this for a second. What did he not have available to him as a prince of Egypt? Could he have all the money he wanted? Could he get any job that he wanted? Is, is there any girl that he could have cast his eye upon and said, whew, she is beautiful, I want her to be my bride. I have a feeling Pharaoh would have made it happen. I, I don't think there was anything that was withheld from him as, as a, 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 the, the son of Pharaoh's daughter. I, I believe that it was all available to him. But there came a point in his life when it says, the Bible says, he refused to be identified as that. Because he knew that that's not who he was. He was something else. He was somebody else. He was a Jew. He was, uh, he was, uh, he was a born uh, to a Jewish family. Uh, his heritage was the heritage of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. Listen, he knew that he was not the son of Pharaoh's daughter, but he also knew that his people were in bondage. They were slaves. They were forced to make brick with mud. They were forced to, uh, uh, they, they served in houses. They, uh, uh, they, they, they weren't a free people. They served as slaves. They had no control over what they did. They, they, they worked forcibly without pay. In fact, when, when he goes to, to, to uh, years later, uh, when he goes to bring the people out, uh, they, 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 take, they make their job harder and, and make life harder for them because of all of that. They had no control. They only had to follow the rules. He no longer wanted to be identified as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Here's a question for you. Dan mentioned, really got into it this morning. Who are you identified as? If, if I were to go to your workplace, if I were to, to go to your school, who would other people identify you as? Now, I could ask you, who do you identify as? And, and well, I'm a Christian. Sometimes what we identify as, and that may not even be the first thing that you identify as. I used to say, while well, I'd walk into a house, hi, my name's Rob Richardson, I'm a paramedic with this ambulance service. I identified with my job. Sometimes I identify, because you, you young people may identify with what school you go to. I'm a student at whatever school you go to. I know you go to Gardner. Because <laughs> you're not the only kid there. I don't know where your friend goes. Okay, she goes to Gardner. All right, so uh, you may identify with what school you go to. You may identify as well, my mom and dad are, right? I, or I, I'm a part of this club. 
Or, or uh, I, I work at this shop. I, I, I run this business. I do this over here. I'm part of this family over here. Uh, you may have heard of this. So, uh, we identify our ways in many. How many times do we identify ourselves as children of God? As followers of Jesus Christ? Because the Bible tells me I'm not of this world anymore. The Bible tells me that I have a new name. It's written up in glory. We sing the song, there's a new name written up in glory, and it's mine. The Bible says that, uh, that I've been adopted by the Father. Behold, what, what, love, uh, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us, that we should be called the children of God. We're to, to, we're to be able to walk worthy of the name that we're now called. We're followers of Jesus Christ. Do we identify as that? And not only do we identify as that, do others identify us as that? Because it's one thing to say it. It's another for to have somebody on the outside, somebody over here that, 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 that hasn't talked to you yet. What would they say about you? What would the, 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 the kids in your school say? Or what, what would the, the people at work say? What would your family say? Other than, well, they say they go to church, but, you know, they're just like the rest of us. There's nothing different. They make fun of other kids. They, uh, uh, they, they swear at work. They, they, uh, they do this over here. We, we, yeah, we saw them at the bar last week. I'm not following anybody around if that's you. I'm, not, I'm just, just using this as illustration. There should be something that identifies us with Jesus Christ. But Moses, to, to be identified as a child of God, to be identified as a Hebrew, made a choice. He said that he no longer wanted to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Look at verse 25. Choosing rather to suffer the affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. What were the afflictions of the people of God? They were slaves. They were looked down upon. The, uh, there was, there was uh, racial, uh, racial tension. Uh, 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 they, 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 were, they were dirty. They, nobody liked them. They, they was, uh, just because they were Jews. On top of that, they were slaves. They had to work for free. They, they had to live in bondage. They were beaten. Uh, Moses, was, uh, Moses, before he, uh, he delivers the people of Israel, he tries to deliver them in his own strength and, and kills a man because he's beating a slave. They, they were beaten. They were tortured. They were, uh, life was not easy for them. And, and Moses made a choice. He looked at the lives of the people of Israel and he said, I'd rather live that way than live in sin to live in Egypt and be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Why? Because I'm not the son of Pharaoh's daughter. I'm a Jew. And something in him rose up and caused him to, to make that choice and to step away and to put away all of those things of Egypt, the pleasures of sin for a season. Sin is pleasurable, isn't it? Not when we get caught, but when we don't get caught, it's pleasurable. Come on, the Bible says it's true. Listen, it, we need to understand the whole context. With this. It's pleasurable, yes, for a season. While you're on this earth, sin is, is it pleasurable to have a lot of money? Now, it's not sinful to have a lot of money. What do you do with that money? Might be sinful. Where do you go with that money? That might be sinful, but it can be, it can be fun to do things that, that, are, that the Bible says is sinful. Have you ever seen a commercial for alcohol? What do they show in the commercials for alcohol? They show people at a party, having fun. They're all running around, and, 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 and uh, it's, just, it's great. They don't show you the, the drunk beating his wife. And they don't show you the child with the bruises all over him because uh, they don't show you the, the, the car accident with the, 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 the dead people hanging out of the car because of the drunk driver. They don't show you those things. They show you the fun stuff. So it is pleasurable for a season. Relationships outside of marriage, can they be pleasurable? I'm not going to lie to you. God made... God made sex and God made for marriage. And it's pleasurable, but it's made for marriage. And it can be pleasurable outside of marriage. Unfortunately, it's only pleasurable for a season. And there's a lot of damage that can be done. And a lot of lives that are ruined because somebody decided to take part of that pleasure. Drugs can be fun. Why else would the drug addicts do it? Seriously. 
the, the feeling of uh, uh, the, the, the feeling of the, the high feeling, that euphoria that comes along, the, the good feeling. Listen, I'm not going to lie to you and say that sin is not pleasurable, but it's only pleasurable for a season. And the, the end of those things always comes down to death and destruction of your life. And Moses looked at the pleasures of Egypt. Now, Egypt, the, the, the people of Egypt considered themselves better than everybody else. They, they were the, the, the people of the world. They had everything. That, that, there was so much that they had to offer. And, and Moses looked at that. And in fact, he probably partook of some of that as he was growing up. And he could have had all of it. But he said, I'd rather suffer the affliction of my people because this isn't me. If you're here today and you're saved... Can I tell you that you may live like the world and you may act like the world, but if you're a child of God, you are not of this world. And you need to make a choice today that I'm no longer going to welcome the pleasures of sin for a season, but instead I want to suffer the afflictions of my people. Now, as Christians here in America, we don't suffer much affliction. We talked about this in Sunday school. There's, there's not a whole lot of persecution uh, as, uh, like we would think back in those days. Uh, they were in chains. They were in bondage to, uh, to, 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 the, Jew, or to, the, to, to the Egyptians. There was a lot of, there was a lot of down, uh, downside to what Moses w- was accepting when, when, he, when he rejected one identity and chose another. But I want you to understand, he looked at that and said, that is better, not just because that's who I am, but let's look at it. Why did, he, why did he choose that? It's found in verse 26. Esteeming. That means he, 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 he considered that the reproach of Christ, the affliction for God, was greater riches than all the treasures of Egypt. Now, Moses was an Old Testament saint, and he didn't know Jesus. But Christ is the other word for Messiah. We think of Christ, we think Jesus. And Jesus was Christ, the Messiah. Moses thought the word Christ, not the Messiah. It was, he, what was he doing? He was identifying himself with God and being a child of God. He said he esteemed, he considered that the afflictions of God's people, the afflictions of being a child of God was better, was more riches than the pleasure of sin for a season. When are we going to start considering that the things of this world really aren't all that great? When are we going to look at what the Bible says is sin and say, you know, that looks fun, and it probably is fun for a little while, but can I just say to all of you, especially you young folks, it isn't that great. I've been there. I've done it. It ain't worth it. There is damage that will happen in your life that you cannot change. There will be scars that are left because you can't go back and fix that. And you may heal and you may move on, but you can't fix that. And you're a child of God if you're saved. You need to identify as a child of God and say, listen, I would rather suffer for Christ than identify as that. Moses made that choice. He made it because he esteemed, he considered the riches of Christ. He esteemed the, 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 the worst that Christ had to offer. When I say the worst, the, the afflictions of Christ, better, greater riches than all the riches of Egypt. What, what does that tell me about Moses? He was more heavenly minded than he was earthly minded. He was more heavenly minded than earth. Uh, what, I, what I mean by that is, was that his mind was, uh, was not so much on those things that are pleasing for a short period of time, those things that are pleasurable, those things that will go away. Listen, you can have money in your bank account and be gone the next day. Uh, last night, my, water, my hot water stopped. And, we, and then uh, as I was downstairs, uh, having to, trying to get it going again with some help on the phone, um, afterwards, uh, we got it going a little bit, and it was, I thought we were going to make it till Monday, and then it started smelling like oil and unburnt oil in the house, and we had to call somebody in. And we call somebody on the weekend, cost more money. All that money could be gone. 
I've had, I, I used to follow Dave Ramsey's uh, plan. I don't know if anybody's ever heard of Dave Ramsey. Great financial advice. Uh, I had $1,000 uh, in my account for emergencies, and a month into having that uh, in my emergency account, um, my water pump died, and it cost me $994 to get it replaced. Money goes. Money comes and money goes. It's, it, it's, it's temporary. You could, you could have uh, cars, rust, uh, electronics. Uh, uh, everybody's got phones on them these days. I don't know where mine went. There it is. It's on silent, just, just, just so you know. Everybody's got these things. Guess what? It's not even, this is a, a Galaxy, a Samsung Galaxy Note 8. It's already out of style. They think they got the Note 10 or whatever is next. Uh, it's broken. Can't see it. Maybe you can't see it from there, but there's cracks in my screen. It's, in a year, it'd be worthless, right? Because it's junk. I say that as I gently set it down, so I don't have to go out and buy another one. It's temporary. In fact, it's not even really needed. We convince ourselves that we need the things of this world. I'm not saying you shouldn't have a phone. I'm not saying that's sinful. We get so caught up in the things of this world and the things of this earth that we forget about what's truly important. The Bible says, Jesus said that, uh, that uh, what gaineth a man if he gain the whole world but lose his own soul? I could have everything. I could be on top of the world, the most famous, the most famous person, wealthiest person, uh, greatest singer, musician, I'm not, I know that, by the way, but I, I could be that guy and have everything and still have nothing. How many of those people die of drug overdoses because they're looking for something? A lot of them. How many of those, those, uh, uh, those actors and actresses go through marriage after marriage because they're looking for something and they can't seem to find it because they're not going to find it in relationships? We can look for, for that fulfillment in a lot of different places. The truth is, you're not going to find it in those things. You know, you, you know where you'll find it? In your identity with Jesus Christ. That's where Moses found it. He said, listen, I don't want to be the son of Pharaoh's daughter. I am not the son of Pharaoh's daughter. I am a Jew. I would rather suffer the afflictions with my people in here in Israel as a slave in Egypt than have all the riches of, that Egypt has to offer. And he did it because he esteemed those things better, worth more, than all that Egypt had to offer. But if we're going to do that, if we're going to forsake the things of this world and identify ourselves as Christians, I love Hebrews for this reason. It says, by faith. We call it the Hall of Faith, and it goes, it goes through um, Abel and, and Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the other people. This is by faith they did this. They did these things trusting God, trusting in, in the promises of God, never seeing the actual God that, they, uh, that, they, that, that had made the promises. They're just trusting that his word is true. Uh, uh, so, so by faith Moses did these things, uh, trusting in it, the verse, the verse 27 says that which is invisible, or he that was invisible, trusting God. But by faith, he had to do something. If we're going to, by faith, identify as, as children of God, as Christians, and esteem the things of God more than the things of the world, we need to do what Moses did in the very next verse. It says he forsook Egypt. He forsook Egypt. So you can't tell me that you value the things of this world if you cling to the things of this world. You can't tell me that you value the things of heaven if your life is about how much you make uh, every week and paying all your bills. Listen, uh, you know, that back in, there's a booming industry that gets bigger and bigger and bigger. I know a, a, a young man, he's, he's an atheist. Pray for, I, I, I'd say his name if we weren't online, for you to pray for him. Uh, he lives here in the city of Augusta. He owns over half a million dollars of property. You know what, he, you know what his, his business is outside of what he does for work? His business is he owns storage properties. He went out and bought some property and had the, those, little, those little buildings put up and people come in and they pay to store their stuff. Forty years ago, there was no such thing. People had, if, if people had a little extra, they put it in their garage or their attic. 
But before that, they didn't even do that. Why? Because there's just so much stuff nowadays. People have so much stuff they don't know what to do with themselves. They have to, they have to, they have to rent a place just to put their stuff that they're never going to use again. Because their, their, their lives are intertwined with the things of this world. Paul told Timothy, he said, the, uh, the endure hardness like a good soldier of Jesus Christ. And a good soldier uh, doesn't uh, entangle himself with the things of this world. But why? Because we're, we're here, we're children of God, we're fighting a battle against a spiritual battle every single day. And if we're intertwined with the things of this world, how can we fight? How, how, can we defend, how can we stand for the Lord? How can we be identified as children of God if we look and sound and act just like the people of the world? It's not enough to say, I don't want to be known as. You have to do something about it. So, verse 27. By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured a single one who is invisible. Now you know the story of Moses, or the account of Moses. Uh, Moses, when he came to this point, uh, the book of Acts says that God put it in his heart uh, that, uh, uh, that, that, uh, that, that he would lead the people of Israel out of Egypt to, to, to lead them to freedom. And I believe he did that back in, the, back in the, the early days of his life. When he stood up and said, I will not be known as, as, as uh, the son of Pharaoh's daughter, uh, uh, that he made a choice and that directed his life. And God put it in his heart that he would one day bring his people out of Egypt and out of bondage. But what happened when he tried to do it on his own? He saw one of the, the Jewish slaves, one of the Israelite slaves, being beaten by a man. And what did he do to that man? The Bible says he rose up and he slew him. And the next day he comes in, to t comes in and he's like, hey guys, how you doing? And they're like, what are you going to do, kill us? Like he did that, he's talking to slaves. He assumed that they would all be for him and that he would be able to get some, some, some traction with this and maybe, but no. So he ran. Now here it says he, he ran not because he feared the king, not because he feared the wrath of the king, but because he trusted in God. When he forsook Egypt, he left all those things behind. Where did he go? He went out into the desert and became a shepherd. And he, and he, he, he served, uh, served for 40 years, worked as a, as a shepherd for 40 years uh, uh, with his father-in-law. And it was after that period of time as God humbled him, as God showed him that he couldn't do this in his own strength, but that he needed to do this in the strength of the Lord. It was after that that God said, I want you to go back and lead my people, tell Pharaoh to let my people go. Oh, and we know, we know the rest of the story. But, but something happened. First, he made a choice. He knew who he was, and he made a choice. And instead of being, being, being who everybody else was or thought he was, he decided and chose to be who he was, a Jew. And in doing that, and esteeming the affliction of Christ greater, he then forsook the world behind now, that doesn't mean you have to go out and live in the desert, because that would be crazy, right? It doesn't mean that you have to go live up on the top of some mountaintop, or that we should go build a, a commune and all of a sudden kumbaya, and that's not what I'm saying. But we need to forsake the things of this world and cling to the things of God. Because when you forsake one thing, you're running to something else. You're not just running. Because if, if all you're doing is running away from one thing, you'll just end up in something worse. You have to have a direction. He forsook it and went to the desert where he found and met the Lord 40 years later. And I believe, honestly, I believe that, that he was serving God there. So in your Christian life, what do you need to do? Forsake the things of this world and esteem the things of God much greater. How important is your time of reading your Bible? 
How, how important is that time that you get to spend with the Lord, reading your Bible and in prayer? It, sh- it should be, as a child of God, that's your bread and butter. That's breakfast, lunch, and dinner. You eat, right? Jesus said, man should not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Do you, do you esteem that greater than you do Facebook? What's the first thing you do when you get up in the morning? Let's see what everybody else did. Oh, look, there's a, there's a cat. Oh, the dog is cute. I'm not, I'm not saying that Facebook can't be used for good. I'm not saying that it's even wicked or evil. There are bad things on it. It can be used for bad, just like we can use anything. It's, 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 it's neutral. But do you esteem God greater than technology? Do you esteem God greater than social media? Do you esteem God greater than money? Do you esteem God greater than friends? Do you esteem God greater than your job, your career? The truth is family. Dan read the verse earlier. I don't know if you got my notes or what, but Galatians chapter 2.20. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life that I now live, I live by faith of the Son of God. It's Christ that lives in us. We need to set aside our old man, to, uh, to be crucified with Christ, deny ourselves. Jesus says it this way in Matthew chapter 16, verse 24. We'll end here. Matthew chapter 16. Verse 24. So then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up the cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, and whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. Jesus is talking to his disciples. He's not talking to people that are lost. He said, listen, if you're going to follow me, you need to deny yourself. You need to, you need to identify yourself, not as the world, but identify yourself as a follower, a disciple of Jesus Christ. Deny yourself, uh, d- 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 die to self, however you want to phrase it, and you need to pick up your cross and follow me. You need to endure the affliction that, that, that is set before you. You need to serve God where you're at. You need to put all the things that you deem as important and be like Paul and say, listen, those things that I counted gain... They're all for loss. I count them as done. What is it that you esteem in your life? Who do you identify? Who are you? Was the question that was up there earlier. Are you a child of God? And if so, have you forsaken those things? Or are you still sitting in Egypt saying, I'm I'm an Israelite? I'm not saying you have to come in wearing black and suits and ties and, and look like me every Sunday. Please don't. I'm not, I'm not pretty. And we don't want to have a church full of people that look like me. What I'm saying is despise the things of this world. Despise the things that God's word tells us to despise. We're to, we're to, when, we, when I say we despise the world, I don't mean the people in the world. I mean the things of this world, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life. Those, those are all things that, that will cause us to sin. The Bible says we can't love the world and love God. Who do you love this morning? Are you ready to, to have you set those things aside? Are you denying yourself? Are you ready to make a choice? So this doesn't make sense. Why would I do all that? Because Christ died for you. Hebrews chapter 12. I said I was finished. I'm almost finished. Hebrews chapter 12 verse 1 says, Wherefore, seeing we are also compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us and let us Run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who, for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross. What was the joy that was set before Christ? Us. And because of that, he laid, he laid his, everything aside and put on flesh of man. The Bible says the word became flesh. And he came here with a specific purpose, to die on the cross for our sin. So I don't need that. You know, it's, it's, it's funny. I've heard a couple people say it this, this last week. 
unless somebody knows they need to be saved, there's no need of a Savior. I've said it myself before, but I'm listening to my wife's testimony. Um, she, she was talking to me about something the other day, but I was talking about when she got saved, when she decided to follow, or when she came to Christ. She thought she was a good person. Listen, she had a, she had turned over a new leaf. Most of you, if not all of you, already know my wife's testimony. She, she was not a, she was not a, 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 a goody two shoes growing up. She was trouble, with a capital T R O U B L E. She got into drugs and all the other stuff, and she got into rehab and cleaned up. And when I say drugs, I don't mean she, t- she smoked pot. She, she hated that. She, she did uh, all the other stuff, meth and coke and all the stuff you hear about, read about, see the documentaries about. And she got clean. She didn't get clean because Jesus saved her. She wasn't saved. She got clean because people can do that. And she came here to this church when we were dating. Pastor Williams had invited, or invited us, advised us we, we should come. I was working, she came here, and he preached a message for three weeks. He was pre- preaching a series on the Ten Commandments. After the third week, she, she cried all the way home. Because she suddenly realized she wasn't as good as she thought she was. Even though she changed all those terrible things that she had done, from what she had done before, she wasn't doing it anymore. She knew she still needed a savior. And if you don't understand that you're a sinner and on your way to hell, you will think it's all just crazy. But God is our creator, and He created us to have a relationship with us. And when man sinned, the Bible says that broke that relationship and that that sin and his punishment passed upon all men so that all have sinned. The law, the Ten Commandments that was preached, simple, the moral law, thou shalt not lie. How many of us have lied? Let's be honest. Everybody's lied at some point. How many of you stole them? And I don't mean you held up the store with a gun. I mean, you took something that didn't belong to you. Even credit. All of us have done that. How many of you have taken the Lord's name in vain? That's when you swear, you're using the name of God or the name of Jesus. as a swear word. All those things are, are found in the Ten Commandments. The Bible says if you've committed one sin, you're just as guilty as if you committed all those sins. And that's only ten of the rules. The Bible is full of a whole lot more. And the Bible says this, for the wages of sin, what we earn from our sin is death. And not just physical death, we all physically die, but it's talking about a spiritual death, a separation from God for forever and ever. God's in heaven and we're in hell. We just finished up a study on hell. The last three Sundays, Sunday afternoons, we, we looked at what the Bible has to say about hell. Hell is a terrifying, terrible place. It's a place of being alone. It's a place of fire and torment and pain and fear. There's nobody there to comfort you. There's nobody there to encourage you. It's not a place of death. It's a place of eternal torment. And if you die lost without Christ, that's where you go. And as terrifying as that is, the Bible says, knowing the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. There's a reason I'm bringing this up, because if there's anybody here that is without Christ today, I want you to know that Jesus loved you so much that he gave his life on the cross to pay for your sin. See, God is just, and all sin must be judged. But God is, and God is holy and perfect, but God is also good. And because God is good, he loved us and sent his son to die on the cross to pay for the sins of the whole world. So he paid for your sin, but we need to trust it in faith. Knowing something, knowing what the gospel is in our head is a whole lot different than trusting in it. 
I loved my wife. I wanted her to be my wife. She was not my wife until I proposed and we said our I do's in the pastor's office, or in my, in my office uh, now, in my office uh, 12, almost 12 years ago. You can know the gospel. You can know what the, that Jesus died for you. You can know that you're a sinner. But until you, by faith, ask for him to save you, you're not saved. The good news is, the Bible says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. There's no question about that. There's no ifs, ands, or buts. It's not, well, you might be. It says, shall be. It's a definitive. It means, it, 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 it's, it's like if I drop an apple, it will fall to the ground every single time. Why? Because of gravity. If, if I call upon the name of God, he will save me. Why? Because he said so, and God cannot lie. So why would, I, why would I turn from the world and the pleasures of this world to follow after God? Because he died for me. And I've accepted that. I've accepted in my faith. And man, he has done a work in me. I, uh, we, we talked about that in Sunday school. The, 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 the riches of, of Christ in you, that mystery. Uh, it, it, it's, it's, a, it's amazing. It's not, we're not just talking about heaven. That's, that's a benefit of salvation. But God begins to do a work in us to change us. I thank and praise God for that. That's why I turn. I'm not of this world. I'm, of, I'm a child of God. If I'm, if I'm here today and I'm lost, you don't have to be. Today is a day of salvation. I'll tell you this one last thing, and, I, and, I'll, and, I'll, and I promise I'm done. I have done t- two funerals in the last month of people that, were, that died long before anybody ever expected. A 26-year-old yesterday. And Scarlett, who was a year and a half. Life is short. Don't think that you have time to do this stuff later. Whether it's salvation or forsaking the world, today is the day. Right now. Because we don't know what what tomorrow might bring. Or if for us there will even be a tomorrow. What we do know is the Bible says this, there's a point in a man who wants to die and after that the judgment. One day we'll all die and we'll stand before God and we'll answer for our works. If we're saved, if we're saved uh, we, we've made it through the white throne judgment and we'll be judged for our works. And God will look at us and say, did you forsake the world? And we'll have to answer for every idle thing. If we're lost, when we die, we'll be separated and sent to hell for all eternity. And as crazy as that sounds, it's a terrible, terrible place to be. And it's eternal forever. I pray that this spirit speaking to your heart this morning, that you listen to him. Don't let, don't let things distract you from the spirit of God. Let's yield to him today. Father, I thank you for this day. God, I pray I pray, Lord, you'd help us as we, as we go forward in the invitation. Lord, if there's one here today that's lost, Lord, help them to know that they're lost. Lord, help them to, to, to come to a Savior. Lord, if there are those here that uh, maybe they've been tangled themselves in the world, or they, they, maybe they need to make a choice to, to, to choose, choose Christ over the, the things of this world, Lord, may, may you help them to make that choice. Lord, I pray that you would just have freedom to work in our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.